All right, Christopher here. Welcome to Do Explain. Before we begin, I'd like to thank my current supporters who inspire me to carry on with this project and make it financially viable as well. I'm very grateful to all of you. Big hugs. And while I'm not in the business of telling people what to do, I can't share my vision for Do Explain going forward. I like to work on the podcast full time instead of just a few days a month. I want to build a real platform for the fun and friendly exchange of interesting ideas. And I want to do it ad-free, if possible, because I don't want any ideas to be off-limits for us to explore, and I also want to keep saying dumb shit without repercussions. But to do this, I'll need a steady income, and that's why I need your help. So if you enjoy what I'm doing here, and you want to join me in my vision and become a part of growing this project, consider going over to patreon.com slash doexplain and sign up to become a monthly supporter. All right, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy this episode. All right. So I'm very grateful to be here today with not one, but two very interesting individuals. And so first, we have much appreciated former guest, Merrick Doyle. Merrick, how are you doing, man? Yeah, all good. And yourself? I'm doing fine. And uh, then we also have much anticipated new guest, Dr. Pervy Parikh. Dr. Parikh, thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this. And um, like we said before, we started the recording here. We're a little tight on time today, so I'm going to keep the pleasantries to a minimum. But I think it would be great if both of you could just give a short introduction of yourselves so that the listeners know who's talking here today. And so just uh, shortly what you do and what you spend your days thinking about. And uh, Dr. Parikh, I'd like it if you go first. Sure. I'm happy to. So um, I'm an uh, allergist and immunologist uh, based here in the U.S. Um, And, you know, besides outside of my busy practice since the pandemic has begun, I've been very involved um, with COVID-19 vaccine research because, you know, of immunology. So I've been involved in five of the COVID vaccine trials, um, both industry sponsored and non-industry sponsored. We're looking at a host of things, you know, from the initial approvals to, you know, safety in pregnancy and children and and what have you. Um, But outside of that, you know, I treat, you know, all patients who have, you know, severe and life-threatening allergies, asthma, children, adults. Um, And most of my days I spend thinking about when this pandemic will be finally over so I can go back to (laughs) enjoying my life (laughs) and traveling, which I love to do, which I haven't been able to in two years. So that's, that's me. (laughs) Yeah. I think we can all relate to that, that late part, but um, yeah, that sounds like a a very interesting day job. I have to say. (laughs) And uh, so how about you, Merrick? You've been on before, but for those who didn't hear that episode. Well, so I am a nutritional therapist. So my days are dominated by working one-to-one with individuals who have particular health goals. Uh, My focus is very much on personalized nutrition. So looking not just at what is the standard way to deal with migraines or insomnia or IBS, but instead to look at the individual's metabolism and what particular obstacles may be stopping them from responding to protocols and what's going to be a most ideal way to help them. So that dominates most of my day. I have spent a little bit of time looking into uh, the wider events and uh, doing my usual PubMed dives in regards to COVID and the like. Although I've got to say, the thing that dominates most of my time right now is a little boy called Teddy, who is uh, just only <laughs> six months old. Oh, that's awesome, man. I'm really happy for you. Me too. Congrats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're actually starting to sway me a little bit on the uh, wanting to be a father someday. So, um, wow. My I, wife I is think very the best grateful. way I could ever describe it is that if somebody told you to select your favorite hobby and then said you must spend many hours every day doing that hobby, <laughs> that's not so bad. Nice. That's very nice. <laughs> yeah. No, that's lovely. 
All right. Yeah. Before we get into the actual vaccine discussion here, I feel like I just want to introduce and maybe frame the conversation somewhat to explain, yeah, what my thought was and why I want to host this conversation between you two in the first place. Yeah. So the first part is basically selfish. I am, like many people, um, lazy in the sense that I don't want to spend a lot of time learning about the immune system and uh, sifting through actual research. You mentioned PubMed there, Merrick. And it's it's kind of hard to parse all the information coming at you. And we're in the middle of a pandemic where you still want to be able to uh, make the rational and moral decisions, both in regards to yourself and, and also other people. And so instead of, of helplessly trying to navigate all that, I thought that I would get two people who have done that work for me already and who, who, who is already spending their time thinking about this, but are on the opposite sides here to some extent to discuss it in an open forum here where I can then take a step back, listen to your arguments, and then make a decision for myself. And I feel like there are probably a lot of people in a similar situation that would appreciate that. And then the second reason is I feel like there's been a particular lack of nuance when it comes to this topic. Yeah, where if you're not aligned with the main narrative of COVID vaccines being in general a really good thing and, and most people should take them, then you're kind of automatically labeled as a conspiracy loon, you're anti-science, you think 5G is the devil. First of all, it's not true. That's a false dichotomy. And there are reasonable opinions and different readings of the same science and the same data. We know from this podcast that's very epistemological that, yeah, data has to be uh, interpreted by theory. And so uh, my goal and my wish here today with you two is that we can have this more nuanced discussion where you two are the representatives <laughs> for science-minded, rational, good faith discussion here. And uh, hopefully it can be useful for other people as well. Do you resonate with that at all? Yeah, sounds, sounds great. That sounds good to me. All right. Well, then let's get to it. So uh, I think a good way to start it off is if you could both sketch out your current position on the vaccines in general going into the discussion here. So I'm thinking in terms of, yeah, how effective they are, their safety profile, and whether most people should happily take them or not. And then we can open up for, for interaction between you and go into more specific things here. So um, Dr. Parikh, it's my sense that you generally align more with the main narrative. Provided that's correct, I would love if you could start us off here. Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so you are correct. I mean, if the main narrative is that I, overwhelmingly, you know, I feel from my experience conducting the studies and reading other studies that have been published that the vaccines are, you know, very safe and very effective. Um, you know, I, I myself have I was fully vaccinated and I actually even recently received my booster shot last week once it was approved for healthcare workers um, in the U.S. And, and the reason being is that overwhelmingly what we're seeing um, in the United States is that currently majority of people that are passing away, uh, our statistic is 99% um, are largely unvaccinated. And the majority that are in the hospital, that, that means like in the ICUs, on ventilators, very ill. And, and you know, I, I invite both of you or anyone listening to this podcast, if they'd like to come in and round on any of these wards, uh, just to show you like what what the day to day is, at least for healthcare workers in the US, um, are mm -hmm. all largely unvaccinated. So that's why I feel for the most part that, you know, it is safe, it is efficacious. And, and now we have so much data to back it up. Just yesterday, I heard a statistic that, you know, 6.4 billion doses have been administered worldwide. So that means at least everyone has gotten one dose, half of the human population. Uh, 3.4 uh, billion people have gotten at least one dose of the vaccine. So I understand concerns initially that, okay, we're giving emergency use approvals with 30,000 people, 40,000 people, but now we're having, we have data across billions, you know, and, and that as a scientist, that makes me feel better. 
the more reproducible something right. is, of course, that, that gives me uh, comfort that, you know, what I'm taking in my own body and what I'm advocating for other people to take is, is safe, first and for, foremost, and efficacious. So so that's kind, kind of how I view it, because for me, the data is very clear, you know, that uh, it is uh, overwhelmingly protected. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so before you, I, I heard a breath there, Merrick. Uh, I'm sure you want to interject, but so yeah, just uh, stretching. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. But so, okay. So if you want to give your equivalent uh, outlay there. Yeah. And you may well not be too surprised to hear that. I think very different things. And I think one of the biggest problems here is uh, yeah, that the leaning from the CDC and the other governments around the world in conjunction with the uh, various mainstream media sources on these major headlines and the selective reporting of certain statistics that, for example, one we just heard, which I personally cannot fathom, can be true. And I'll explain why. Now, obviously, if we were truly seeing uh, that 99% of people in the uh, hospitals were all unvaccinated, um, then this would indicate some sort of extreme effectiveness of the vaccine. Now, I'm not looking to get into a black and white uh, delineation of it works or it doesn't, because I think there's a lot of nuance there, which hopefully we'll get onto. Uh, but if that was the case then we would see some impact somewhere in the world uh, in regards to total deaths, case numbers, or, or hospitalizations after the rollout of the vaccine. Specifically, we'd see a positive effect of it, whereas we just haven't seen that anywhere. Conversely, we've seen a lot of the opposite. Uh, and by that, obviously, Israel is the most discussed and uh, obviously... The discussion certainly uh, came to the fore when uh, Dr. Kobe Haviv uh, came out and noted the exact opposite, that 95% of severe patients are double vaccinated. Uh, equally, then, the, the data from the uh, Israeli study, which shows that you are 27 times more likely to be hospitalized if you are vaccinated versus uh, those who have natural immunity. Uh, so this is something that really can't be ignored. And of course, we're not just seeing that in Israel. We're, we've seen that in Gibraltar. They had less than an, an average of less than one case a day and then got 99% of the population vaccinated, upon which there was an explosion of cases, hospitalizations. We, we've seen uh, an amazing uh, event in Bhutan, who took uh, one of the most ambitious rollouts, 64% of the population vaccinated in one week, and went from having almost zero problems to having a, a huge issue. Uh, we've seen the very similar patterns in, in Iceland, in Singapore. Um, we've seen it in Florida. No matter where you look at if you take a population, roll out the vaccine, immediately we get to see a substantial climb in problems. And yeah, with each and every month that goes by, we're seeing more and more data. We're seeing that uh, certainly with the Public Health Scotland uh, data, it is very clear that month on month, the vaccinated are overrepresented in hospitals, admissions are overrepresented in deaths. So I'm not saying it's not possible that a ward in a hospital somewhere on earth is going to have 99% uh, vaccinated. But what I would question is how are those vac uh, how, how are those figures being classified? Are they being classified via the CDC standards? Because if so, that kind of explains everything. Are you talking about hospitalizations and uh, severe cases of COVID after the rollout of the vaccine? Well, that's the data that we've got. Yes, I think that you know, the, the COVID-associated uh, hospitalizations are extremely important to look at. Although, yeah, you, you do touch on something much bigger as well. What's the total uh, effect on health, which is actually much more important from my perspective uh, than the myopic focus on 
we've squeezed down COVID-19 cases in the elderly following vaccination, which is true. I'm, I'm very much in agreement with that. Um, in elderly populations, we can see that the numbers dying are associated with COVID has reduced following vaccination. Mm. The big problem, of course, being that the cost of achieving that, we're not seeing any reductions in deaths overall. We're not seeing any improvement uh, in health outcomes. We're seeing a lot of incidences where public health is being increasingly uh, destroyed. And this is a really big concern. And, and obviously, without wishing to go off on a tangent, I think it's extremely prescient to consider what did Geert van den Bosch, one of the world's most celebrated vaccinologists, say in March this year? He warned that if we rolled out uh, a S-spike protein-based vaccine to healthy populations, then what we would see is likely a temporary drop in cases, hospitalizations and death, followed by a sustained surge everywhere it went. Now, everything that he predicted is exactly what we're seeing, but nobody wants to talk about that. Yeah, Dr. Perig, do you want to comment? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to. So there's a few things uh, that I disagree with in the sense that a lot of the certain uh, surges that we're seeing now, largely due to new circulating variants, many of these variants were actually emerging and spreading prior to uh, vaccine rollout. So even if you look at the Israeli data, there as well, it's very clear um, that there are actually was effectiveness. So there was a drop in deaths, there was a drop in hospitalizations. Now, eight months out, they did start to see immunity waning from the vaccine. And that's why they opted to give those booster shots. But again, with the boosters, they had excellent responses. And again, we are seeing those decreases in deaths and hospitalizations. Now, speaking of the figures I had mentioned earlier about the 99% deaths, it's not in one isolated ICU in one hospital. This is across millions of people uh, in our country. This is an aggregate. Um, and in terms of the amount of hospitalizations and those who are unvaccinated, again, this is in almost every single state, this is what we're seeing. And what's also interesting, the U.S. being so large, and many would argue that it's almost like multiple countries within one, because if you go mm -hmm. to this, it's very different than New York versus California. The states with the highest vaccination rates have the lowest amount of uh, COVID hospitalization. So New York, for example, in California, who have vaccination rates close to 70, 80 percent, their infection rates are still very, very low and their hospitals are not being overwhelmed. We're, we're not seeing the surges, you know, that the vaccinologist that uh, Marek had quoted was uh, worried about. But the, the places where the vaccine rates are extremely low, Texas, Missouri, Louisiana, those Florida, those are the places that are getting completely crushed and pummeled. And where we're seeing that now when people are going for other non-COVID related issues, uh, like their gallbladder is infected and needs to come out, or they have flu or anything else, they are having trouble finding hospital care because those hospitals are so saturated with COVID-19. They're sending, you know, Floridians and Texans up to Minnesota and, and thousands of miles away. So it's not isolated by any means to one hospital, one ICU. We're seeing this reproduced across millions. And then just going back to my original point, um, it's a very, very linear correlation. You know, as the more globally, more doses are given out, those areas are seeing uh, true decreases. The problem I think we've, we've seen with America is that firstly, anybody can still go on to the CDC website and type in weekly provisional counts of death by state and select causes. And therefore, you can track directly exactly what the changes are. Uh, are going on in, in all of these counties. And so in that sense, it's extremely difficult to find any pattern uh, along the lines of what you're saying there. Now, I can appreciate that the released figures, the statements made by the CDC, absolutely adhere to what you just said. 
Uh, but we've got this huge problem, which I think explains why everywhere in the world is observing the pattern that I've just discussed. And America, despite showing absolutely no drops in death anywhere without seeing any uh, yeah, different in actual outcomes, hard outcomes um, anywhere in uh, those states that you've mentioned, is still uh, reporting these incredible, uh, incredibly positive outcomes. And to that extent, it's probably really helpful for a lot of the listeners to, to point out um, what uh, changes the CDC made on May the 1st in terms of reporting uh, on May the 1st. And I'll, I'll happily send you uh, the link in the chat uh, right now. Uh, they changed the reporting uh, of breakthrough cases. Uh, so the idea here being that the cases were now uh, going to be only reported if it resulted in hospitalization. And then e only then if breakthrough cases uh, tested positive on a cycle threshold of 28 or less. Meanwhile, so, uh, non-vaccinated individuals, they are still tested exactly as was the case prior to that. So what I'm saying is, Whenever I look at a scenario where the entire world is seeing all these problems, all of these studies done across the world are showing that there is substantial increases uh, in illness amongst those vaccinated several months after the event, when the uh, Public Health Scotland, the Public Health England data makes a very clear case that the vaccinated uh, are overrepresented in hospitalizations and deaths up until their 70s. When I'm seeing all that, and yet equally at the same time, there's not been any drop in death in America, just fantastic headlines. My first question is, well, what could explain that? And obviously, if you're going to change uh, the, the way that vaccinated and non-vaccinated are, are counted, making it at least 13 times more likely uh, that uh, a paired uh, vaccinated and non-vaccinated individual will be missed, scrubbing off 90-something percent of uh, the vaccinated uh, population from the figures. Well, of course, the figures are going to look good. And that's, I think, an extremely important point uh, that people should be aware of, uh, that, yes, this is categorically uh, not the outcome. We should be observing hard outcomes that are hard to manipulate by the CDC. Suddenly, it doesn't look so good. I just want to clarify something. The data I was quoting was not CDC data. So um, I I know I have my own issues with the CDC, so I, I'm not going to argue with you there. But um, yes, we have the aggregate CDC data, but the, the data I was quoting is from the New York Department of Health, California Department of Health, and they did not change the way in which they're counting cases or deaths or any of that. And there is actually a data of clear decrease in deaths. I was in New York City the first three months of the pandemic, and it was a war zone. I mean, we heard ambulances 24-7. There were ice trucks outside of hospitals for dead bodies. We, we had... 800, 900 deaths a day, that is clearly not occurring anymore. And we even had a large surge before the vaccines were approved last winter. So even as bad as those first three months were, um, that winter time was the deadliest month, the December, January. And this was before most people were fully vaccinated. Then we saw a clear decrease in New York, California, places where these vaccination numbers increase in, in deaths and in hospitalizations, predominantly in vaccinated individuals. So this none of this is CDC data. So I just want to be very, very clear on that. But going back to the CDC data, there's one thing that's very important, I think, for the audience to understand. There's SARS-CoV-2, right, which is the virus. And then there's COVID-19, which is the actual infection and the disease. So there are mm. asymptomatic carriers of SARS-CoV-2, and, and no vaccine 
has ever promised that you will you will never contract the virus. The whole point of a vaccine is one to save your life, you know, avoid the you know the death and destruction that we've seen of you know millions of people globally, and two to keep you out of the hospital. So even if you survive, you're not one of those individuals who are still. I see long haulers on a daily basis that are still not working. 18, 19 months later, they can't concentrate. They have lung transplants, kidney damage, all of these things. So recovery isn't easy. I wish it was, but it's not it's not like recovery from the flu or common cold or anything like that, you know. So that's the whole point of the of the vaccination. It, it's not that you it's not to make you unable to ever contract the virus. But if you do, either you have no symptoms and you go about your life and you're healthy and fine and there's no issue, or you have very mild or moderate symptoms. So that that is the importance, I think, the, and the reason why CDC changed the way that they're accumulating their data. But that being said, I can speak to you know New York State Department of Public Health, California State Public of, uh, Department of Public Health. They did not change it. They're counting every single case, asymptomatic, mild everything. So so there is a clear difference. Um, and I, I don't go only based on CDC data, because I agree with you, I've had my own frustrations with the CDC, including as recently as last week, when they were coming to a consensus on the boosters that didn't make sense to me. And luckily, the director overruled them. So Mark, I'm with you there, that they're not a perfect body either, but I'm just explaining that mm-hmm. I don't only go to one source for data because as a scientist, good data is reproducible in multiple sources. So I go to, to multiple advocates, you know, so I just want to clarify that, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a advocate or spokesperson for the CDC and I've openly criticized them. You can just look at my Twitter account over the last five <laughs> <few> months. It's <laughs> always good to find agreement somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I do think there's a very important point to make in response. And uh, as you said, there was this this huge uh, crush on the system during the winter months in the, the peak of the pandemic. Right. Then, of course, um, over the spring, the vaccine was rolled out. And I agree with you. The figures, the total number of deaths dropped. And herein lies the problem. Do we not think that there might be a confounding factor there? If you're measuring the rate of death in Christmas week, in the peak of Mm -hmm. a pandemic, and then you roll out the vaccines, and then suddenly, four months later, you determine, well, actually, the rate of death is a whole lot lower. We do need to be open to the possibility that there's more than just vaccines going on. Comparing the death rate per 100,000 in the peak of a a wave of infections versus when it's actually no longer um, spreading within the community, that doesn't tell us much about the effectiveness of the actual product. And, And indeed, the that the main Israeli study, in fact, the first one uh, to come on out um, to to show us, you know, this this substantial drop um, in uh, death following uh, the vaccine. I think that is a really good example of what I'm talking about here. Um, what we're seeing there was there was a 72 percent drop in death. Before the vaccine actually was administered, and uh, by the end of the study, the the drop in death uh, uh, compared to baseline was was point seven. Now, it's not to say that the vaccine increased death. As I'm saying, there's a lot of confounding factors, but um, these are the, the the studies that we are fed that are saying, look at what a spectacular drop we're seeing following the administration of a, a vaccine rollout. And yet, and I'll, I'll actually I'll send over this, um, this study and the graphs at the bottom, which actually lay out. I don't believe for a second that any of the authors of that study actually missed that. There's a really crucial bit of information to see that they, they split the um, time period into before 21, more than 21 days before administration of the first dose up to 21 days and then various time periods after that 
before 21 days was considered the baseline. So if we've seen a drop in 72% um, in, in cases as a consequence, then that tells us that factors other than the vaccine are playing a much bigger role uh, than the vaccine is. And, and that's something we've seen repeated. In fact, um, our good friend Boris Johnson, he is very fond of trotting out the the information produced at uh, Manchester University, whereby, yeah, we're seeing something very, very similar. We've still got a, uh, yeah, a, a baseline study done in the midst of the winter months, and the biggest drop came before even the single dose was administered. So, yeah, that's where uh, I think... There, there's a really uh, important role for remaining scientific rather than um, the newspapers, the politicians and certain scientists raving about the before and the after when actually I'm, I'm more interested in fairly comparing what was the relative drop between the um, vaccinated and the unvaccinated which, of course, would give us an idea on, on the efficacy. But equally, um, what's the rate of side effects, including death, which I would argue is one of the biggest side effects of all. Um, and to that end, I, I know you said that you only get mild or moderate symptoms uh, after uh, the, the vaccine. How can we know that when no government in the world is monitoring it? So I understand the methodolo methodological critique there, but so it, it's not only that you think that we, we cannot make the claims about the vaccine that we're making because of uh, these flaws, but it's also that you, you think the vaccine is actually, it's not only not helping, but it's actually doing harm. Is that, is that your claim here? Well, I don't want to um, try and, and paint a single position for it because I think that in itself is a problem. What we've seen, I mean, the Israeli data is very clear um, and you know, as is even the, the Pfizer uh, original data, we see between 40 and 60 percent increase in infections over the first fortnight whenever the uh, vaccines are administered. We then see a drop. Uh, in infections in the months following. Now, the problems seem to be what happens after that. So, obviously, Israel got there first. We're, we're seeing the impact there. And, yeah, we can see that from two months onwards, there is uh, a drop in the effectiveness, at least that's according uh, to the uh, Curtis et al. paper that was uh, put out uh, actually at the start of this month. Uh, that was one of the first ones to try and track that over time. Um, and we're also now up against a very different shift in the situation, which is, of course, these vaccines in those papers for which I think there is a whole load of massive methodological problems and I haven't even scratched the surface there. And I haven't even even touched on the conflict of interest, which I think is equally important. But now we're looking at a different variant. Um, the the Maddie and Bailey uh, study from March that shows that the AstraZeneca jab is only 10% effective against the Delta variant. Um, we can see that in in um, the ONS data, uh, that's that's the uh, Office of National Statistics. Um, this is their September data dump. It shows the effectiveness of vaccines is down to fifteen percent against the Delta strain. Uh, so, yeah, we're we're seeing some very substantial differences now versus before. And equally, as importantly, the study data, the headlines from the study, that's never had the impact it should have done in the real world anywhere if that was to be the case. And what I'm talking about there is why are we not seeing any changes in the number of deaths?
So what one point of clarification that I wanted to make was the Israeli data actually um, did show a decrease uh, post-vaccination. Um, the other thing to also consider, just like you said, how you can't compare winter months and summer months, you're forgetting that many of these vaccines were studied and approved before uh, the variants were widely circulating. So yes, the variants did exist, but majority of the study population was with the wild type virus. So again, a lot of these surges occur from variants, right? But variants can only come about, ironically, if the virus has chance to mutate and replicate from person to person. And that, again, clearly data shows is in unvaccinated individuals because vaccinated individuals don't transmit the virus at at high uh, frequencies and percentages as unvaccinated because they're not getting sick as often and they're not spreading it as often. So again, you have to you have to remember these things because that's what makes this pandemic very challenging. You, you can't compare these snapshots in time because it's wildly different situations. There's uh, variants at play that weren't at play in the initial approval of the vaccine. The other thing too is, yes, there is waning of efficacy, but that was eight months after um, the second dose. And even though there was waning, uh, Israel did see a spike in hospitalizations and deaths, but other countries that are having that waning have not yet seen an increase. So we're still in the U.S., for example, um, even if there is a decrease in effectiveness, we are seeing that those individuals are still staying out of the hospital and they're still not passing away. Uh, and if, if let's say, what, what you're saying is true, then, then how do you explain the fact that overwhelmingly majority of these hospitalized individuals, a majority of those passing away, um, have largely not been vaccinated. If you're saying that these, the vaccine efficacy is dropped and it's you know not working and it could possibly cause more harm than good. I mean, you yourself mentioned that in, in the elderly, it's done wonders, right? It's done wonders to protect our parents and grandparents. So, so, so how would you explain that? Okay. It's the CDC calling. <laughs> oh, no. Um, so, yes, the, 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 you said the vaccinated don't uh, pass on the uh, infection at the same rate. That's a theory which has been proven to be entirely not the case. Um, so we're, we're talking about the, the study in America, uh, which, which showed very clearly um, that that is you know, the exact viral load uh, is found in both vaccinated and unvaccinated. That's the Riesma paper. That's July. Um, that's the reason why Rochelle uh, Walensky made that highly mocked uh, interview with CNN where she admitted that actually, remember when we said that if you got vaccinated, then you could have your freedom back. Well, you can't because you actually pass it on at the exact same rates. So, you know, we've, we've got that exact uh, you know, scientific quantification, um, but even, even the most aggressive cheerleaders for the campaign have hold their hands up and said, yes, that actually categorically is not the case. Um, everybody passes it on at exactly the same rate. And the, the Oxford paper on this side of the pond, uh, Powell's et al., similar date released, that found exactly the same. So, yeah, it's, it's very clear that that isn't the case. There is absolutely no uh, difference found anywhere in uh, those individuals passing on to, based on vaccination status. On top of that, I think that we should be open uh, to looking at uh, the, the rates of infection. Um, and again, I've voiced the reason why I don't trust the data uh, that's coming out of America. A, it's wildly different to everywhere else in the world, and yet their outcome is looking the same. Uh, obviously, the CDC, I'm very familiar with why and the, the deliberate distortions that they've conducted to cook the books. I don't know about the individual hospitals, so I cannot comment. I am going to say that I'm always a little bit suspicious when each individual hospital is paid by uh, central government when there's 
there's money involved, but let's not get into that because I don't know enough about individual hospitals. What I can tell you about is uh, when we look at the yeah the recent um, Public Health England data, this was released on the 23rd, so exactly one week ago, it shows a minus 53% effectiveness in uh, individuals aged 40 to 49. So in that sense, what we're seeing is, yes, there is a, a similar number of infections per 100,000 um, in the 80 plus with improved survival uh, shown in, in the 80 plus. But there is a substantial increase in infections uh, in the 40 to 49 age group, 50 to 59 and uh, 60 to 69, in fact, even 70 to 79, that still shows an increase in the rates of 100,000 getting infected following uh, two jabs. The one thing I want to, again, clarify, increase in infections, yes, again, that's expected to occur because once people are vaccinated, they're going to be more social. The masks, the mask mandates decrease, masks come off. People are interacting more than when they were isolated and masking and separating beforehand. What is crucial is not the infections going up, but are the hospitalizations and deaths going up. Again, yes. I'd like to reiterate, vaccines are, are not a, a foolproof against infection. They're foolproof against severe disease and death. And again, going against what Rochelle said, a, a paper that you know I just saw that came out uh, early August shows that, yes, you can spread it. But the reason why the spread is still less in vaccinated versus unvaccinated is that you are uh, contagious for far shorter amount of time, if at all. And it's the contagious individuals that are able to spread the virus person to person. And this was the same in the study for Alpha, Delta, um, and the other variants that are currently circulating. So the vaccinated individuals cleared the infection much faster. So if I clear an infection in a day or two, right, it's mu- I will spread it to far less people than my unvaccinated friend who might be coughing and sneezing and sniffling for a week or two. So I actually am still uh, bucking against that based on these studies that are now coming out, vaccinated individuals are far less symptomatic and they clear the infection much faster. So yes, I might catch it the same rate as someone who hasn't had the vaccine, but I'm much more less, less, less likely to spread it. And I'm happy to share those studies with you too. Those just came out in the last few weeks. So again, I I disagree that it's the same uh, spread amongst vaccinated or unvaccinated. Just from a common sense perspective, it, it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, about paid hospitals. that This is absolutely not true. I am not paid by any government body or, or anybody, any pharmaceutical, and I see the death destruction with my own eyes. All of my colleagues in all 50 states see that. Nurses, doctors, I know, they're at the point of burnout, exhaustion, suicide at this point with what they're seeing on a daily basis. Yes, hospital administrators are evil. I don't trust them either. But none of these individuals are paid off by the government. I I am anti-government. Let me just put that out there. I'm anti-government control. I'm very, very moderate, conservative individual. I'm telling you, these are real people that are seeing death and uh, destruction across multiple hospitals millions of healthcare workers to the point where we're losing our healthcare workers and none of them are being paid off to lie about COVID numbers or what they're seeing. And again, I invite you both to come to 10, 15, 20 ICUs and and see what they are seeing just for, for one hour, one hour of your time. I would happily do so, but I'm not allowed into your country. <laughs> we'll, we'll do it. I think it's important to clarify. I mean, nobody is downplaying the heroic efforts of all the doctors and nurses uh, working as hard as you're describing here and, and and pushing themselves really hard to help out people in need. So so that I think we all agree on. But so I, I it's interesting listening to you here as an outsider because you both are using the phrase it is very clear or this the data clearly shows and it's becoming increasingly clear to me that it isn't as clear as it might seem. Uh, this is an epistemology podcast as base, so I'm going to drop some hot epistemology here. <laughs> yeah, so like I mentioned in the beginning there, data by itself 
can't tell us anything. Data, the role of data, the role of experiment, and I'm not saying that you both aren't aware of this. I, I know you are. But yeah, the role is to uh, help us choose between different theories that we already have and remove the ones that are incompatible with the data that we're getting. So data by itself, I just want to clarify to any listener here, doesn't say anything without a theoretical framework. And so I would encourage you both to, you've mentioned a lot of studies here. And so feel free to send me any studies you've mentioned. I can uh, put all of them in the show notes and people can go investigate uh, and make make up their own minds uh, surrounding your points here. Because it's hard to follow along uh, with all right. the percentages and, and, and the data and, and such. But so I have a few things I want to ask you about further, which is there seems to be a few underlying assumptions behind people's hesitancy to get vaccinated. And so one of them is that the COVID-19 virus isn't worse than the flu, not worse enough to be, to be notable. And then one point is that the natural immunity confers equal or better protection than the vaccines. And then we have the third one that, that we have reason to suspect potential long-term side effects that could be bad. And it's hard to say at this point. Yeah, we're looking at multiple uh, estimates of the uh, infection fatality ratio of between 0.1 and 0.5%, which some of those would put it as less serious than the flu. Others would put it slightly more serious than the flu. Uh, I don't know how useful uh, it is to really look at the numbers. Uh, I think there is some value in doing that. But at the same time, the real uh, value only comes in, can we use this to just estimate relative risk? And in that sense, yeah, relative risk is surely the most important uh, factor that we should be considering here uh, when making public health decisions. Um, in that sense, if, did we see um, any increase in death above and beyond, uh, say, a heavy flu season uh, anywhere in the world? We did in one country, the UK, but even then there was no difference until uh, they removed 21,000 uh, people from hospital and forced them into nursing homes later on finding out that 6,000 of them were infected, um, then compounded that error by locking them in there, uh, introducing the Coronavirus Act that made it illegal for them to leave and also outlawed them from visiting or having any visits from any of their friends and family, uh, traumatizing them by telling them that they were going to die a horrible and lonely death forcing them into signing DNRs, do not resuscitate orders, and weirdly enough, then dosing them with midazolam at uh, doses multiple times the upper recommended limits. Uh, midazolam, for those who aren't familiar, is a drug for which the side effects are associated with respiratory arrest. Um, so, yeah, that, that's one place in the world that saw uh, an increase in the rate of death above the, uh, uh, the, the usual rise we'd see with a seasonal flu. We didn't see that elsewhere. Um, so I think that's a very important figure when we try and form a viewpoint on, on the relative effect. That's not to take away the tragedy from the families affected because what use are statistics to those individuals that have lost people and often haven't had a chance to say goodbye there's a lot of people who've been affected by this um mm -hmm. but yeah so i i think we need to try and recognize the usages of figures of those type but equally the limitations um now you mentioned about um was it natural immunity yeah so, yeah, natural immunity. I would take the viewpoint that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And it would be an extraordinary claim if for this particular one issue, um, which just so happens to be the one for which $8 trillion of uh, public finances have been transferred into the hands of private companies, it just so happens that this is the one that 
natural immunity isn't superior to vaccine-induced immunity. That, for me, would be an extraordinary claim. But hey, let's not uh, dismiss it as out of hand. Let's actually look to see if if there's any information. Perhaps somebody could you know, study 52,000 employees at the Cleveland Clinic. That could be helpful. Luckily, Shrestra Al did that. And they found previously <laughs> infected people do not benefit from vaccination. Um, what else we can look at? Oh, with well, the Israeli data from July, total of 835,000 uh, Israelis known to have recovered from the virus, even accounting for potential false positives. There were 72 instances of reinfection. So that's 0.0086. Um, again, probably less. There's likely some false positives within there. But uh, yeah, it almost doesn't exist. If only the Irish were to contribute with a study on 615,000 people over 10 months. Oh, luckily they did. Uh, again, they didn't quite manage to break 0.1%. Um, so yeah, we, we, we've got that data. I mean, the LeBert study in the Nature Journal, which shows that 17 years on, uh, original SARS-CoV-1 patients still had memory T cells. Yeah, we've got mechanisms. I cannot see how this would be any different to the usual status quo when it comes to natural immunity. I'll respond because I know we're we're getting short on time. But in terms of the the flu versus uh, you know SARS CoV two flu versus COVID nineteen question, um, you know I I agree they're, they're kind of like apples and oranges because flu is extremely da- dangerous. It is extremely deadly. But if you look at last winter alone, actually uh, COVID nineteen was far worse. We flu cases virtually dropped, and the reason behind it is one we had a surge in flu vaccinations. We were in a pandemic, people wanted uh, that protection. They didn't want to go anywhere near a hospital, understandably. And two, people were masking, people were still working remotely. And so we saw actually the converse of what happens when you do have a mechanism of not just, you know, obviously, uh, good high-end hygiene, masking, vaccinations, comparatively to the uh, the pandemic that was actually going on with COVID-19, there were far more cases. Just last week, COVID-19 deaths exceeded the Spanish flu deaths, which was the last time we had a pandemic similar to this over 100 years ago. But again, I wouldn't compare the two because we, you know, in a normal year, pre-pandemic, we do see a lot of flu deaths. We do see a lot of flu hospitalizations. So I actually don't think it's right to compare the two at all. Because both, as Merrick pointed out, both caused death, destruction, and tragedy for millions of families, you know, before, Mm -hmm. during, and probably even after the pandemic. And it's even more reason that, you know, you need to protect yourself from both viruses. As for natural immunity, um, it's interesting that you mentioned the Cleveland Clinic study. Um, I won, I trained at the Cleveland Clinic, so it has a soft spot in my heart. But the importance of the Cleveland Clinic study was that it was between October to December. So it was over two months. We already know that after a COVID-19 infection for 90 days, yes, you are well protected. I I won't argue that. So so if someone just recently had COVID-19 and doesn't want to rush to get a vaccine, I I don't push them because I know that for the most part, for the first 90 days, they're going to be well protected. But after that, that's when it's variable. And that's when kind of bets are off. So there's been uh, numerous studies that have been shown that 90 days out, six months out, 12 months out, those natural immunity responses are very variable. So yes, some people are lucky. They are able to hold on to those strong T cell responses, some antibody responses. But I personally have patients that had natural immunity antibodies in June of 2020, and they were completely gone by December of 2020. So that is a a reason for the vaccine. Now, do people who had COVID-19, do they need both doses? Maybe not. There was an excellent paper in Science that just recently came out talking about hybrid immunity because, yes, there is benefit to natural immunity. When you get the real virus and, God willing, you survive, then you actually form immunity to all parts of the virus, right? Whereas the vaccines, those are focused on the spike protein because that's the main mechanism in which the virus infects your body. But the problem is that with even natural immunity, those spike protein responses don't last 
as consistently as we've seen with the vaccination. So they last for longer with the vaccinations and they're more durable. But the hybrid immunity to me is very interesting because I think possibly people who have gotten through COVID-19 may only need one dose or may need a lesser dose vaccine. And that's something that we're studying and learning about. So I partially do agree with Merrick, but the, the issue is if you look at all infectious diseases in the history of time, none have reached herd immunity, sadly, without a vaccine. So I wish natural immunity was enough. I mean, I'm an immunologist. I respect the immune system more than anyone, trust me. <laughs> but it, it's just it's <laughs> not enough. But I, I will say that I partially agree with Marek that maybe, maybe if you recover, you don't need both doses. You definitely don't one month out, two months out, maybe even three months out. But then after that, it's in your best interest to at least get one dose of the vaccine. Um, that science study was excellent. And, and I think hybrid immunity actually is the best because then you have those durable spike protein responses and you're protected that way. And you have the benefits of natural immunity that Merrick brought up where you have immunity to other parts of the virus as well. So yeah, that was my issue with the Cleveland Clinic study that it was it only looked at the first two months after infection. But what what happened to those people if they didn't get vaccinated now, right? Do they still have that strong immunity? That's what I'd like to well, know. Well, of course. And I think that, again, it's a very sensible thing to look at the strengths and limitations of every study. And that's a perfect example of that done by the Cleveland Clinic in, in that it was only for two months. So yeah, let's look at the the Irish data. That's over 10 months. That shows the same response. The Israeli paper, um, the the one that uh, obviously has been quoted around the world by people who disagree with the current uh, authoritarian measures, well, that did a six month follow up. But what was particularly interesting about that is it wasn't saying that uh, immunity is just as good for six months, it was saying that natural immunity was 13 times better at avoiding infection and 27 times better at stopping people from going to the hospital. So you, there isn't much of a comparison to be made based on what we know. Um, and of course, when we look at the, the greater picture, we have used our immune systems as a species for hundreds of thousands of years. And so I do think that it's a bit of a misrepresentation to say um, we've never reached herd immunity for, for any illness. Um, I would say, well, it depends how you define herd immunity. Are you saying that the flu's never gone away? Well, of course, it never will, as, as, as the sure. rhinovirus never gone away. Well, it hasn't. Neither would we want it to. Uh, as annoying as it is, we know how big of a training effect that that exerts on young immune systems in particular and conveys mm. benefits against much more serious illnesses further down the line. Um, but equally, we have sufficient immunity um, so that provided we are in a reasonable state of health, we don't all die every winter which I think we can agree on. <laughs> I hope we can agree on that, that you know, we've done a pretty good job as a species of not dying every winter of <laughs> rhinovirus, alvovirus, parvovirus, norovirus, everything else that goes around. So, so in that sense, we've done all that without intervening in our immune system. And when we do that, it comes with potential benefits and potential risks. No one's measuring the risks and the implications are extremely worrying, um, as in the, the implied conclusions from figures, um, looking at the number of unidentified deaths in, in America. You know, there's, what, 40,000 unidentified deaths now above and beyond baseline, uh, which started to rise in the last week of 2020 dropped off uh, uh, in early summer, just the same time that the uh, vaccination campaign dropped off. But when those lines perfectly align with one another, and that's something that Steve Kirch has covered uh, in, in great detail and with uh, impressive eloquence. Um, so, yeah, that's where I would be worried when we've got a system that works really well. It's called the immune system. It's done a great job on all these other pathogens. It's done a great job on every other species of coronavirus. And so there's no reason to think that suddenly on this particular challenge, it's going to let us down. 
provide in the system is is well supplied with the metabolic conditions it needs however um yeah one thing i'd also like to say is that dropping antibodies is a reason for the vaccine i would categorically disagree with that when we know that the level of antibodies in your bloodstream has absolutely nothing to do with the capacity of your memory t cells and thus your resilience against reinfection which is again shown repeatedly again and again and again and again but the one thing I would interject is that so illnesses such as measles, polio, which is disfiguring, have largely been eradicated by vaccines to the point where, you know, people, some people born today, it's like a ancient artifact. They, they would never, they'll never even see it unless the, those places where we have seen some of these breakouts are in largely unvaccinated communities, areas where haven't seen these illnesses in over 30 years, we've only seen breakthrough infections where uh, people have foregone those childhood vaccines. So the it, they, data there is clear, you know, unfortunately, in some ways, these vaccines are a victim of their own success. Um, yes, you know, luckily, we're not dying of rhinovirus, other coronaviruses, even flu. And exactly to your point, uh, vaccines have helped in a sense with the flu. So yes, the flu mutates year by year and year. But as you very eloquently mentioned, memory T cells will still retain memory of that flu virus. So even if you see it in a different form, like for example, I like to explain it like it, it comes in a different outfit or driving a different car. Once that person gets out, you recognize them, right? So your immune system does recognize that flu. And, and vaccines have, in a sense, to um, greatly decrease hospitalizations, mortality, and death from flu itself. Um, and out, outside of that, you know, measles, polio, yes, largely eradicated by vaccines as well. So you, you can't discredit what has already been done. And unfortunately, because vaccines have been so successful, I think people are now saying that, okay, well, where's the proof that they work? But there is proof. The proof is in the pudding, you know? And, and the thing you also have to remember is that Every single death, right, is other events will occur. They'll always occur. So, for example, if I get my vaccination and then, God forbid, I get, you know, three, four months later, I get cut off and I die in a car crash, my husband can go into VAERS and report me as a, a vaccine-related death, even <laughs> though my death, no, seriously, and my death had not, and this is an extreme example, but my death clearly had nothing to do with the vaccine. It had to do maybe with some drunk driver, some teenager texting on their cell phone that cut me off, right? But the same thing happens. And that's why you have to be very, very careful with these uh, data of unidentified deaths. Yes, they probably did occur, but but where is the connection to the vaccine? You know, um, yes, we look at trends, but you really need to see, is there an increased frequency than would normally be occurring in the general population? Were those unidentified deaths still there in 2019, 2018? So, so you have to be very, very careful when those correlations are made. And I think that's what's very confusing for the general uh, public. Um, and that's also a flaw of the VAERS database. It's great because we catch a lot of information, but it's self-reported. There's no randomization. There's no placebo control. So, so it's hard to really say this is a cause and effect. I very much agree that the VAERS system is totally uh, not up to the task. Uh, as you say, it's self-reported. So whilst it is true that we've seen more VARS reports for vaccines in the last few months than we have in all of the last 21 years combined, that doesn't prove anything. And this right. is why it is clearly the case that we need a government anywhere to do that thing where you actually check who's reacting and who's not. Um, and mm -hmm. in that sense, you know, we, we look at the studies on, on side effects. And uh, for example, the Lancet study, which used uh, data collected from uh, app users, users uh, of this, this app in Britain called Zoe, um, which again has, has been wildly mocked because well, not only has, has Tim Spector, the guy behind it, come out as a fairly bloodthirsty individual when it comes to the sceptre of actually vaccinating children, but also they kept all of these useful, lovely, pretty infographics in there to show the total numbers of cases amongst vaccinated versus unvaccinated until, of course, after 
that initial couple of months where we saw some decent initial effects of the vaccine, we suddenly saw a massive rise in the cases amongst the vaccinated, at which point Zoe deleted that graph. In any case, um, having adequately introduced Zoe, they're trying to make a scientific paper from a survey from an app an app that didn't allow any options to report serious adverse events. Um, and even if it did, I mean, how, how are we expecting that to pan out when the ambulance arrives? And what the, the app users are about to say, hold on one second, I need to report this to the app. Um, <laughs> so this is where I'm thinking, well, look at the CDC, for example, 21,000 employees. It would be so easy for them to actually do that thing where when somebody gets a vaccine, they just log their name and then maybe uh, they ask them a question three months later, six months later, 12 months later. That's not difficult. Yes, it will take time, but they've got 21,000 employees. Meanwhile, the British government spent 31 billion on the track and trace app in a desperate attempt to drive up case numbers and justify some of their policies. And you know, that's enough to pay for the entire NHS for about two and a half years. So, yeah, that's, that's a huge amount of money that they spent on something that was proven to be totally, completely without use. But it could have been useful if they'd added a question at the bottom. Um, and it needn't be complicated. Maybe let's just start with the most basic question of all. Every three months, it comes up with an alert and it says, are you dead? Yes, no. And then you just press it. <laughs> how, how expensive would it be to integrate that? Instead, what we've got in the UK is a yellow card system. That's the exact equivalent of the VARS. And the problem with that, again, we've seen record number of, of complaints um, uh, following vaccination. Now, the whole purpose of this scheme is to, to, to act as an early warning system so that we can then fairly and accurately determine, is this a coincidence or not? That's its only purpose. And what did the MHRA say that run it? Yeah, it's probably a coincidence that we're not going to do any investigation. So this is why people are so worried. And yeah. this, when we want to look at, you know, why are people hesitant? Well, because the data indicates not only that there are problems that are not being discussed, but that the government is actively involved in suppressing those problems and bending over backwards doing rhetorical gymnastics to try and justify why it probably could have maybe be a coincidence. And, and that isn't good enough. I, I actually agree with you, Mark. And, and that's, I just want to give you a piece of maybe reassurance. Like all of the vaccine trials that I'm involved with, they are, the individuals are going to be followed for the next five to 10 years. And we are calling them back every three months, every six months, every nine months, because I agree with you, self-reporting to me is not science. You know, it, it's so mm -hmm. variable. I, I don't trust, you know, I don't trust humans, you know, to, <laughs> including myself, to self-report things properly, right? <laughs> yeah, you can't remember. I, I That's can't your remember. last words on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but so yeah. I, I just want to give you all that information that, you know, I think people think that all is said and done. These trials are not done. Like the, from the very first shot, that trial I was involved in in May of 2020, we're still seeing the patients every six months for exactly the reasons you mentioned, um, because that way we we are actually collecting not just subjective information from them. Have you been well? Has any complications occurred? So we can see if there is coincidence or true correlation. But we're also collecting blood work, too, to actually see how long uh, the immunity is lasting, if there's any problems, right? We're, we are also looking for issues. We're looking to see, okay, is, is liver function, heart function, kidney function, all of that. We don't want to see any problems. And, and now we've even started flu mRNA vaccine studies that are even more stringent, especially um, 
from the organ side. You know, we're looking at heart function more extensively, kidney, lung, liver. So I just want to give you that reassurance. I agree. You can't you can't leave science up to government. Like, I think you and I agree on this or something. I think that it's, uh, it's nice to find an area that we heavily agree on. And uh, <laughs> it is good to hear that there are those studies going on. And yeah, for that, uh, for, for that extent, I want to uh, point out that whilst it's very clear, I hope, where, where my thoughts currently reside, I am very open to changing my mind if the data is is indicative that, that I should do so um and so yeah it's going to be tons more clear uh with every passing month and you can only imagine where we'll be at a year from now uh however mm. yeah while it is the case that you know, we are seeing surges in every country that rolled out this vaccine we're not seeing any rolling back of restrictions. We're seeing restrictions being applied in most cases. And, uh, yeah, whether that's Belgium or Iceland or Ireland or, or Chile, uh, Malta, Spain, Portugal, Gibraltar, Bhutan, Singapore. And then I compare them against the countries that don't, uh, 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 don't do the vaccine. So Romania, Bulgaria being the ones that stand out, Haiti, India, El Salvador, when you look at those places in the way that they've gone about it and we see dramatically uh, preferable situations there now. Well, India had, a, had it very bad. They, they were completely collapsing. I mean, we were sending resources there from the U S uh, and largely unvaccinated. They had the Delta variant uh, circulating throughout the country and they've massively stepped up their vaccination um, campaign. In fact, I think last week they hit a record of 25 million or I, I don't quote me on the exact number, but millions vaccinated in one day. So, I mean, India is actually showing the benefit of the vaccine because prior they were they were in very, very bad shape. Well, I mean, clearly India was in a very difficult situation. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And I don't think there's much available information because of uh, a whole load of dynamics. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, we know that they did employ the Bergamo model, uh, by which that is to say no one's going to the hospital unless it's COVID, uh, mm -hmm. which, yeah, <laughs> everywhere that model has been applied, we see total chaos. And of course, yeah. Uh, I, I'm not here to debate should they or should they not have done that. I don't know what resources they had. Um, what I do know is that, uh, yeah, they have now reached 5% of the population vaccinated, but they have 70% herd immunity, according to all the antibody studies. So, yes, they did have a problem, partially based on economics, partially based on healthcare system, partially based on COVID, partially based on tuberculosis, which was no longer being treated. And it turns out untreated tuberculosis is the worst kind. In any case, what we do know right now is they have almost zero COVID in the country, despite having one of the single lowest vaccination rates in the world. So whilst there's clearly you know, a, a fairly complex story there, one from which we can extract successes and failures. Uh, we can extract models that should be adhered to and models that well, should be dodged. The fact of the matter is they used anti-inflammatories and ivermectin as the primary strategy. And I'm sorry I used the I word because I know I've just opened up a whole box, which we don't even need to. <laughs> but, but yeah, same as El Salvador, anti-inflammatories and ivermectin, uh, Romania, Bulgaria didn't do anything um they're amongst the best faring countries globally um but yeah we've got a whole ton of countries that anybody can look at and the the, the fact that they're totally ignored from the discussion i don't know if you knew this chris but sweden no longer exists according to the british broadcasting corporation <laughs> um no it's true i'm doing this interview from hell yeah yeah, I, I don't know how you managed to do it in a country that committed national suicide last year. Um, but uh, but yeah, so that's that's my point. So, yes, I'm very open to the data. But when the literature that supports the COVID is, is so riddled with flaws, 
um, and confuses <laughs> a measurement in the midst of a of a surge of COVID against one where it's not widely spreading as success of a vaccine, um, when it confuses the effect on prior strains with the Delta strain, when it's actually classifying people who take a vaccine and immediately die of COVID as unvaccinated. So, um, yeah, when all of that's going on, I'm going to look at the bigger picture. And the bigger picture right now is a whole lot different to what we're being told by our politicians. Uh, the real world data is always going to sway me more than any scientific study any uh, any uh, would, and, and that's that's obviously something that I think is a very helpful barometer uh, as we go forward. Right. No, I, I agree with you there. I mean, I, I, over politicians, real world data always works. But I think you know, again, to your point, you know. Vaccines take two to four weeks to work and then, you know, eight weeks, six to eight weeks if you're getting both doses of a two dose vaccine. So so why some people who immediately die of COVID the day after they get the vaccine are classified as unvaccinated? It's because that vaccine hasn't had its chance to stimulate your immune system into getting into gear. So I just wanted to make that point of clarification, too, because I agree it's it's very confusing for the average uh, listener or pe- person going through the data because there is so much conflicting data. And, and I completely agree. An open mind is important. And I'm also open to changing my mind as well. Um, Perhaps I can change your mind on the post 14 day spike. Um, so again, great article to summarize all of this in the BMJ. Um, this is actually only put out 13 days ago. Um, but yes, we've seen repeatedly in almost all of the studies that have reported it that the rate of death and the rate of infection in the first 14 days after the first vaccine increases between 40 and 63%. So I would disagree that this is a case of the vaccine has not yet taken effect. Uh, The fact is on multiple different studies are all showing between 40 and 63% hike in death um, and and, uh, hospitalization. So that's something that we really do need to consider. They are doing something. That cannot be a coincidence when it happens again and again and again. From COVID-19? Because if, if that were true, then I, I know many, most of the people I know are vaccinated, including myself. That means 60% of the people I know would have died after the first dose, which is not a sixty percent increase in the baseline levels of death is what we're talking about. Not as, not sixty percent of the participants. That would be pretty spectacular. Yeah, I was like, that doesn't make much sense because even even that from the baseline increase out of I I know so many people that have been vaccinated, doctors, nurses, even non medical community. I haven't heard of one adverse thing just amongst my immediate uh, you know cohort, but. Being involved in these studies, we've had you know uh, forty six thousand with the mRNA vaccines, um, close to fifty sixty thousand with the adenovirus vector. I'm the one that gets all the after hour phone calls from patients with issues. Uh, I haven't heard any of these, you know. So, so I just want to make sure that, and I'm not saying that it's not true, but again, are these deaths? Uh, something that would have occurred with or without the vaccine, that's the key. And from what we're seeing, we're not seeing a correlation to the vaccine itself. Uh, otherwise, I'm not crazy. Like, I've had three doses now. Why Why would I do that? Of the well, I know I mean, cognitive dissonance is something that we all suffer from, and I'm not excluding <laughs> myself there. Um, but, but, but it is going to be really worthwhile uh, reading this article by Peter Doshi, uh, entitled COVID-19, Do Many People Have Pre-Existing Immunity? Um, and, um, yeah, the the interesting thing is, uh, yeah, where he then breaks down uh, the, the spike, the post-first mm-hmm. dose spike. Um, so, again, I'll post that in the show notes because it's not one study that we're seeing it, which I admit could very much be uh, written off as coincidence. It's multiple studies, and they're all showing a very similar um, response to the uh, yeah that that first uh, fourteen days. And yeah, conversely, I 
I'm dealing with a lot of individuals who have health issues. And I think it's important to preface this by saying that my uh, client population are not going to be representative of the population at large. Uh, because otherwise, why would they be coming to see me? Um, however, of the 19 that have had uh, that vaccine, two have ended up in intensive care, which is, I would say, a, a, a very different picture to what uh, we're, we're being shown and presented uh, in the wider news. In my larger cohort, I know two healthy 30-somethings that have died of heart attacks. Now, in both cases, it was determined that it had nothing to do with COVID-19. Of course, it's very difficult for an active mind, such as the one between my skull, but to, to actually consider, well, I've, I've literally never known anybody within a couple of degrees um, of, of me to have died of a heart attack um, at, a, at what we would call a young age. Um, so this is where, yeah, when people are saying no just another coincidence just another coincidence and when we're seeing footballers um you were seeing actors we're seeing two jamaican cricketers collapse within 10 minutes of each other a few days after the shots again you know it could be totally coincidental but while that keeps on happening and while all these coincidences are, are playing out and no authorities want to investigate them <laughs> with the justification that it's probably just all the coincidence. Um, you know, that, that's a really, really important thing. Um, and, yeah, I, I think that that's going to have a very a big impact on the thinking of a lot of people who – just struggle to believe uh, the institutions that told them that the, the IFR was definitely going to be 5% and that Sweden was committing national suicide and the vaccines were going to give back our freedom and that lifting restrictions would result in a spike or returning schools was going to result in everybody coming down. So it, all of these things that they kept on saying that actually turned out to be the exact opposite. Yeah, this is where we're at. Yeah, I and I agree. Um, you know, everything, every death should be investigated. I, I'm not saying it shouldn't. Um, nothing should be written off as a coincidence. Um, but we just have to see that it, that's the whole point. It has to be investigated. Um, to my knowledge, at least with the studies I'm involved in, they are being investigated. So I, I, every death, any say. any adverse thing is taken seriously, even if it uh, seems to have nothing to do with it. So. I, I completely agree with you there. And and I think um, I, you know, I like Chris's suggestion of kind of putting all the studies together with this podcast. Uh, so that way people can, you know, take the time, delve through it and kind of make a, a educated and rational decision for themselves, you know, and their families. Yeah, I feel like I, I'm really happy with how the conversation turned out. I feel like it uh, fulfilled this purpose. We're still being very cordial and uh, I really enjoyed having you both on. So thank you so much for your time. I'm excited to listen back to this in a more comfortable position. I'm sitting very uncomfortably <laughs> in my new <laughs> apartment. This is the first episode recording since I moved. But um, yeah, thank, thank you both. It was very fun for me. Thank you, Dr. Parikh. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, thank until, you until part two. Yeah, I, I look forward to <laughs> it.